Dr. Julio Romero Guaro is Vice President of Strategy and Business Innovation at Quanta Technology. He has 25 years of experience providing leadership to Quanta Technology in the areas of technology and business strategy, innovation, grid modernization, distribution systems planning, reliability, resiliency, and integration of distributed energy resources and emerging technologies. He has developed solutions in these areas for electric grid utilities and regulatory boards in the USA, Canada, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Asia. He is a senior member of IEEE and currently serves as vice president of membership and image in the IEEE PES governing board. He has served as the chair of the IEEE Distribution Subcommittee, chair of the IEEE Working Group on Distributed Resources Integration, editor of IEEE Transactions on Power Delivery, and editor of IEEE Transactions on Smart Grid. He is an adjunct professor at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. The questions for this week's episode are provided by IEEE, P-E-S-N-E-D-U-E-T, a student group in Pakistan, and their first question is, considering that the renewables sources can't provide reliable energy due to unfavorable conditions like low wind pressure and cloudy weather, what can we realistically do to get off fossil fuels as soon as possible? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And um, I think that they are referring to the variability um, of renewables, the, the most uh, popular ones, um, wind generation and also solar generation. As we know, this is variable or intermittent renewable generation. And, and that is a challenge. Integration in, in the uh, power system, in power systems in general, is, is challenging. So there are two, uh, two perspectives here. The, the first angle is uh, what do we do short term? So what we are trying to do, of course, is uh, to transition into this uh, clean energy world. It doesn't have to be 100% renewables. We need to make, we need to make that, um, uh, that clear. It can be 100% uh, clean. So that means we are going to reduce emissions. Um, but it doesn't have to be 100% renewables. So short term, what we um, what we should do is um, um, to try to what, what we call firm up that variable renewable generation. How do we do that? We can use uh, storage, energy storage. There is a challenge there as well. And the challenge is that long term or long duration energy storage is still uh, expensive and there are some technology challenges uh, that, that need to be addressed. But still, I think that with the, the existing technology, there is a possibility to integrate, we are doing it already, to integrate this uh, variable renewable generation using energy storage, along with uh, transition technologies. And natural gas is one of those. It is not necessarily 100% clean, but it's uh, certainly a lot cleaner than some of the, the, the traditional coal-based um, and heavy fuel oil generation. So um, those two are our solutions that we are using. Um, besides that, we are also trying to use uh, advanced um, inverters to, um, to so, so, so renewable generation has the ability to provide some of the services that traditional generation um, is able to provide. So, so that's short term. Now, long term, something that we haven't discussed, I think enough in, in our industry, is the uh, the possibility of re-envisioning the, the grid, re-envisioning the power system. Um, the reason why we are using energy storage, the reason why we are using um, natural gas is because um, traditionally the, the power system was designed based on large central uh, generating stations, with synchronous machines with um, uh, inertia, able to provide inertia. Uh, in the future, if we get rid of those uh, synchronous machines and everything is power electronics inverter based, we need to think about new ways to plan and design the grid. Um, and, and that is something that, that yeah, we need, to, we need to spend more time doing. And, and since this is provided by students, I would say that's a great area for those who are interested in, uh, for instance, uh, doing a, a PhD dissertation or a master's, a grad students, I think that that's a, that's a great area to explore. 
Well, tagging along to that, what areas of study should electrical engineers focus on if they want to impact that climate change? Um, yes, that's a, that's a very good question as well. Um, so the first thing would be to, um, to discuss, let's talk about what climate change does to, to the grid, to power systems in general. So there are also two angles here. Uh, one is, of course, it causes a variety of impacts. And those uh, impacts are the, the most concerning ones, I would say, are related with more frequent and more intense uh, weather events. And um, for instance, I live in Houston, Texas, in the, in the Gulf of Mexico area here in the U.S. And um, we are very much familiar with hurricanes. Um, actually, the hurricane season is about to start. and um, what, what has happened in the last uh, 20, 30, 40 years is that the intensity of hurricanes and the frequency of hurricanes is increasing. And, and, and um, uh, research uh, supports that this is related to temperature increase, um, ocean temperature is increasing, and, and that's causing um, more frequent hurricanes. But we also have heat waves in general. We also have cold fronts. We also have wildfires. And all of these events affect the electric uh, infrastructure. So they lead to uh, more frequent and also to longer duration outages and well, service interruptions. Um, and so, so how do we address those two, uh, those two issues? Well, there are two perspectives here. One is decelerate um, climate change. So what do electrical engineers do to, um, to, uh, to contribute to that? Well, uh, I think that we have a vital role, especially in designing solutions to facilitate the integration of renewable generation. We were talking about integrating renewable generation. It's, it's not easy, and we are doing that. As electrical engineers, we are um, developing solutions to do that. The other angle is um, uh, transportation electrification. Uh, I think that that's going to change uh, the way we do things. Um, you may have heard that the new F, um, 150 Ford F-150 electric uh, uh, lining is the, the, the name of this vehicle is about to be released uh, in this fall. So uh, you can see that there is, a, there is a very interesting trend going on on electric transportation. Um, so, so that's on the, I would say, decelerate climate change. That's one contribution that we can make. The other contribution, the, the other contribution is on mitigating those impacts that I was mentioning before. So designing a power system that is more reliable, a uh, power system that is more resilient. Uh, reliable, well, that we need to minimize the, the frequency and, and also the duration of the service interruptions that I was mentioning before. And more resilient, a system that is able to withstand and also to recover from this type of uh, disruptive events. Um, but at the same time, climate change is impacting the uh, baseline weather. So in general, uh, temperatures are increasing. Even in winter, we have milder winters, etc. And all of this is creating also greater consumption. So we are consuming more electricity because we need to cool off our homes. Um, and, and that imposes a greater stress also on assets, um, power, power grid assets. And, um, and, and also the fact that we are consuming more energy can be, a, can be a challenge, right? So we need to implement also energy and efficiency measures. We need to manage those assets. Um, and, and that's another role that in which electrical engineers or engineers in general, energy engineers, let's call them that way, uh, have an important role to play. Let's delve more into the topic of temperature, like you were saying. When we see some locations experiencing temperature swings of 30 degrees Celsius or 30 degrees Fahrenheit or more in a single day, global warming of 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit or one degree Celsius seems small to a common man. Why is the change in global temperature a concern? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, well, returning to the way, um, um, well, how the grid was designed, and I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll go to a very specific asset, um, transformers. It's a very specific one, but it's uh, very important. And, um, and there are millions of uh, transformers all over the power grid, all over the world. So uh, that asset was designed or operated in general. The, the, the intention is, um, well, it's loaded, 
uh, to full capacity or close to full capacity. And sometimes even you may exceed um, the rated capacity of transformers for a few hours every day, even every day. And then at night, um, that asset is, is suspected, is supposed to, uh, the loading of that asset is supposed to go down. So that way, uh, it, well, that asset is cool off. So, so that's, uh, that's how it works. So it's loaded, heavily loaded. And then uh, in the mornings, early in the mornings, late at nights, it's not, it's unloaded. So, and so when we, um, when temperature increases, what happens at the loading of that acid remains, may remain relatively constant or, um, the swings, those swings that I was mentioning before, they are not going to be as pronounced as in under normal operating conditions. And that affects uh, that asset's life cycle. So maintenance, more frequent maintenance may be required. Uh, you may even need to replace that asset, um, let's see, sooner than you uh, originally expected. Um, it may lead also, that type of operation may also lead to, uh, let's see, to more frequent outages uh, and, and even to uh, um, additional expenditures that were not uh, estimated by utilities when, when, when it was deployed. On top of that, if we, we were talking about transportation electrification, transportation electrification is also expected to be charged uh, late at night and also early in the mornings. We go home and uh, we plug our vehicles to uh, to the grid, and then they are charged overnight. So um, that also affects the loading of transformers. It may affect also the loading of lines and cables and so on. So what we um, what is going to happen, or what is already happening um, to the grid, is that those consumption patterns that we used in the past to design the grid, those consumption patterns and load curves or load shapes are changing. And um, so we need to investigate, we need to, uh, to, uh, we need to be ready, investigate what type of impact that's going to create in the, in the grid. So, so that's, that's an example of um, some of the impacts that um, temperature increase may, may, may create in the grid. Now, I talked about how ocean temperature is also changing, how that fuels um, more frequent events and how that create disruptions to the grid. So we need to prepare for that too. Then you also have wildfires, for instance, in California, in Australia, all of that is uh, basically a consequence of that temperature increase. And that ends up also affecting the, the power grid. So I think that's interesting how the climate change is affecting the power grid and the resources. If I'm understanding this question from the student group correctly, they're saying if there's only a one degree Celsius change in temperature, is global warming really an issue? I think they're saying, why are we so concerned about this? I, I hear what you're saying about tra tracking those trends and seeing how they're impacting our resources, but they're wondering why are we so concerned about this if there's such a small incremental change in global warming? Yeah, that, yeah that's, a, that's a good question. Well. When you compare how uh, temperature has changed through thousands of years or millions of years, so yes, temperature is going to change. It's a, it's a, there is a cycle, right? And then, um, so scientists that study that cycle, they, um, they are aware of that. So that's not necessarily surprising. The, the, the challenge or the concern is that in the last 100 years, basically since uh, the, the Industrial Revolution started, a little bit more than 100 years, the the pace um, of that um, increase has um, uh, accelerated. So that's the concern. And the correlation between that uh, temperature increase and human activity, increase in human activity, emissions, et cetera. So there is a correlation. That, that's the concern, that if we don't do something about it, it's going to continue. And, and eventually, well, we, uh, we experienced uh, that um, last year and even this year. Officially, the, uh, the hurricane season, as I mentioned, starts in, in June. But last year and this year, we had uh, the first tropical storms, and, and uh, at least here in the, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, in May. So uh, if things continue, we may uh, end up with uh, hurricanes and tropical storms in, uh, let's see, January or... March or February. 
Now, as you're saying, the industrial revolution kind of sped up this impact. Do you think there are any major scientific breakthroughs that can actually help us tackle these issues related to climate change? If so, then what role do you think ele electrical engineering will play in this? Yeah, that's, um, yeah that, that's a good question from uh, students. I think, yeah, as I mentioned before, I think that there are a few areas in which they can focus on. One of them is, I mentioned long duration energy storage. I think that um, although it is, uh, there are technologies, there are certainly technologies that with that capability and probably the, the most uh, well-known one would be uh, uh, pump hydro, uh, but pump hydro is something that you can de deploy in very specific areas under very, under very specific conditions. It's not something that you do, let's see, um, in your neighborhood, right? So, um, so to try to identify or try to develop uh, a technology that is modular, that can be deployed uh, everywhere, and that has that capability, long duration energy storage, I think that that would be a major uh, breakthrough. Uh, it's an area of focus. Another one would be, um, uh, there is plenty of uh, research on, on modular nuclear. And, you know, nuclear is, um, perhaps this is controversial what I'm going to say, but from an emissions, purely emissions point of view, let's, let's, not, talk, let's not talk about nuclear waste. Yeah, that's, that's a problem. That's something that needs to be addressed. But from an emissions point of view, it's considered a clean energy. Um, but if we had that capability to develop more modular nuclear generation and to address uh, how we handle a nuclear waste, that would be another uh, excellent option for um, decarbonizing the grid. Um, and then new um, uh, carbon-free generation technologies, that would be also another major breakthrough. So um, a fusion, for instance, could be another. Other one. Uh, all of this is being uh, investigated uh, as we speak. Uh, those are areas that I think are very relevant for students these days. Do you think the idea of a microgrid is easily duplicated in other areas, or does it differ in capacity and design complexities case-wise? Um, yeah, that's that's a nice question too. Um, so the, the short answer is. Um, a good amount of what is involved in building a microgrid can be standardized. And that is, um, that is what we are aiming at. Why? Because if you standardize the majority of what you do uh, when you build a mi microgrid, then it becomes simpler to deploy it. It becomes uh, more, um, uh, let's say, cost effective to deploy it. If you have to customize every single thing, then it becomes an, an expensive solution, right? So, um, so a good amount of what we uh, have to do can be standardized, but there will be always a, a need for uh, customization because um, microgrids can be applied for a variety of, uh, of things. Generally, uh, one of the key applications is improving resilience and improving reliability of uh, part of the grid. And, and the classic example could be uh, um, a, a community that is located at the end of a long distribution or sub-transmission or transmission line that is prone to, to outages. So, um, so you deploy a microgrid at the end of that, in that community, and then every time the, there is a problem with the grid, you, have, um, you can provide service to those, uh, to those customers. So that's kind of the classic example. But there are others. Uh, in some cases, it's purely integration, facilitating the integration of renewables or trying to realize some of the benefits that renewables can provide. It can also be providing some bulb bar support. Uh, there are a variety of applications. In some cases, it's actually what we call stack benefits. But um, I think that, yes, we are heading in that direction of a standardization. It's going to take, uh, it's going to take uh, some time, a few more years, uh, but there will always be a need for a customization. It's like when you build a substation, when you build a, um, a distribution feeder or a transmission line. We have some um, recipes, let me use that word. So we have some kind of standard designs, but in some cases there, there is a need for, um, for customization. How would you explain the idea of a smart city and what are the obstacles developing countries like Pakistan would need to overcome to develop a smart city? 
Yes, that's um, um, that's an interesting area. So uh, smart cities are becoming very, very popular uh, all over the world. And uh, the overall intention is to use technology to improve the livability, the workability and sustainability of cities. Um, th the intention here is to make sure that there is coordination among all of the different initiatives that are being implemented by uh, local governments all over the world. And in some cases, in the same way that we have the smart grid concept on the electric side of things, there is smart water, there is smart uh, telecommunications, there is smart transportation, et cetera. Smart everything, right? So, uh, and then that is uh, achieved through technology, through, um, uh, let's see, IT, through telecommunications, et cetera. So uh, the intention here is to try to, um, to realize the potential benefits from synergies among those, uh, those initiatives. So I'll give you an example. So uh, for instance, um, in, from, a, from the power grid point of view, when, um, when we have to restore service, there, there has been a storm, for instance, and you have to restore service, that's, that's what we call outage management and restoration. So you, crews need to physically drive, and in many cases, uh, to an affected area and, and do uh, and repair the issues, right? Locate and repair the issues. So, but if, you, um, if you're connected through um, a smart cities initiative with uh, a smart transportation uh, system, and also if you're connected through uh, also smart cities initiatives uh, with uh, let's see a weather uh, weather advisory service, then you can optimize the the way you you get to that point. You know when to get to, to that point, and and you know when a uh, storm is coming. You know the intensity of the storm, and, and you can plan. You can make all of this more efficient. So that is the the overall intention, and that ends up improving the livability of the city, the sustainability and the workability of the city. Now, from obstacle, the, the obstacles point of view, I would say, uh, at least based on my experience, I think that in, in develop, all, all over the world, but I would say probably in developing countries, one of the key issues is uh, bureaucracy. Co this coordination that I was mentioning before can be challenging, especially when um, these uh, initiatives are under different uh, organizations. Same government, but different organizations. There is a lot of paperwork and a lot of meetings, a lot of uh, uh, interaction that needs to take place uh, to, uh, to execute. So uh, in those cases, our recommendation is uh, there has to be a strong leader uh, to sponsor the initiative, somebody who can Somebody who is actually above all of these uh, different organizations who, can, who is going to say, you, know, you guys shall do this, right? And uh, let's execute. So that type of uh, coordination is, uh, is critical. That, that has been my experience at least. Now we're almost out of time for this episode. So the student branch also wants to know why you think that some students are still hesitant to pursue some STEM topics and what would you say about your career path as an engineer in your journey? Yes. Um, well, I think that, uh, in my, my opinion, I, I think that STEM is, uh, you know, science, technology, engineering, math. I think that is a super cool area. I think that um, perhaps um, one of the reasons why uh, kids are not that interested in this area is... Um, it's lack of awareness about the impact that you can make. You know, look at what we are doing right now. This conversation wouldn't be possible if engineers had not designed um, the internet, uh, had not designed telecommunications technologies, had not designed Zoom, right? So uh, the impact that, that we can make, the transformational impact that we can make is, is amazing. Um, but for one reason or another, it is not seen or it has not been seen as a, as a cool uh, area of study. And engineers are not necessarily seen as cool guys, right? I think that we need to change that. We are very cool guys and we do very cool things. Um, I think that when you're in, in high school uh, or middle school, probably uh, athletes, everybody wants to be an athlete, right? Athletes perhaps are the cool kids. Um, so, and, and, you know, maybe, maybe I would say, uh, maybe in the future that is going to change. And then the, 
you know, the, the kids who are doing robotics, who are doing coding, uh, who are designing some of the solutions that, that I was describing before, maybe they are going to become the, the cool kids. And, and it's, it's, a, it's going to require a lot of PR on our side. So, uh, but I think that is, that is possible. Um, on my side, my, my uh, perspective is, or my background, uh, since I was a kid, I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to, to solve c- complex problems. Um, and I was very fortunate. My parents, I think that they saw that, uh, um, that interest and potential in me. And they always stimulated my intellect with, uh, I remember my, my dad buying me cool gadgets since I was a kid. Um, and, and going beyond Legos and robots and things like that, uh, microscopes, telescopes, and things like that. And, and also my, my mom uh, and my, my, my grandmother, uh, her mom, they were fundamental also in in, um, in motivating me to pursue this uh, this career. So, um, so in summary, I think that all of us uh, engineers and everybody who works in STEM, uh, I think that we have a role to play to communicate that value, as I said, that impact that we can make uh, to uh, to future engineers. So they uh, they join us in in this uh, in this journey. Wonderful. I appreciate all the information you've shared about climate change, microgrid, resources. What is the best way for the viewership to continue to follow your work? Oh, well, um, thank you. Thank you so much for, again, the invitation. It's a, it's a, it has been a pleasure. Uh, well, I'm very active in, in social media, especially in LinkedIn. So uh, you can look me up uh, in LinkedIn. And, uh, and also, well, you can follow my, my Twitter account. I have a Twitter account. My Julio, just look for Julio Romero Aguero. And um, I publish frequently. I present frequently. So you'll see my, my updates. And, uh, and also, well, my, um, uh, the company I work for, uh, Quanta Technology. So you can, you can uh, look it up over there, too. Um, some of the, the activities that I, uh, that I do regularly. So um, yeah, I'll be I'll be happy if you if you have if you, the audience has questions if they want to um, learn more about some of the topics that I mentioned today just email me and I'll be happy to to chat with you guys. Wonderful, and we'll include all that information in the show notes below. Julio, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you again for the invitation. It was a it was a I enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please click like below and also subscribe to see future episodes.